We're going to read from three separate passages of God's Word this morning. All will, will come together in, in our, our sermon later on, and you'll, you'll see how they come together. First of all, this morning we're going to read from the, the parable we read at our evening service last week, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, and we're going to read this parable as we find it in verses 25 to 37. The parable of the, the Good Samaritan, or Compassionate Samaritan, as we called it last Sabbath evening, as we find it here in Luke chapter 10, page 1057, if you're following along in the church Bibles. Page 1057, we, we take up a reading from the Word of God at verse 25. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw me pass by on the other side, so likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Then we turn to our second reading to Acts chapter 4. Over the course of our, our series and the, the deacons, short as it has been, we have looked at, at a passage in Acts chapter 6. We're, we come this morning to read from Acts chapter 4, the, the final five or six verses. Acts 4 verse 32. It's on page 1112 in, in the church Bibles. It gives us a little snapshot, snapshot of the, the early church in, in Jerusalem. Christ having died, risen, left his, his disciples here in Jerusalem with, with the, the early church. This is, is a picture for us of, of the church at that time. Verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There wasn't a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the, pro the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And we'll, we'll turn in our final reading to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, where we find a verse that, that will be the, really the, the, a verse that ties all our thoughts together this morning. Galatians 6 and, and verse 10, uh, on which we will hang most of, of what we're thinking about this morning. But we'll read verses 1 to 10 of this final chapter of Galatians. Galatians 6, we'll begin at verse 1 and read through to verse 10. It's on page 1188 in the Church Bibles, page 
and 88. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. And here is Paul's writing again to the fledgling church, the New Testament church in Galatia. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. But the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Amen. We end our readings of, of God's Word here in Galatians, and we pray that, that God will open our eyes to, to the, the challenge of these verses, open our eyes to what God is saying to us through His Spirit in these verses as we come to, to look at them in a short while. Please turn with me again to... Well, it's hard to know which passage to, to turn to. We'll be flicking between um, all three of them at, at various stages. If, if, you, if you turn to, to the passage that we, we read, first of all, in, uh, in the book of Luke, and keep your finger in, in Galatians, and we, we'll be referring, I think, mostly to Galatians 6 and, and verse 10, and, and drawing again from the, the parable of the compassionate Samaritan from Luke chapter 10. We have one of those passages open in front of you and, and the, the little bookmarker from your Bible and, and the other one, so you're able to, to move between the two. As we've looked at the, the office of, of deacon over our past, I think, three services, we've seen that this role is one of service, leading and, and overseeing the, the work of service both in the church, among the people in the church, and, and by the church, our outward-looking service by the church. Although we're all called to be servants, we, we've seen that a number of times, we're all called to be servants, but this office was established by God to lead our, our corporate acts of, of service as a church. And one aspect of the service that we're called, that deacons are called to lead, and indeed all Christians are involved in engaging, is that of compassionate service. Last Sabbath evening, we looked at this aspect of our service, the compassionate service that Jesus calls us to here in, in the parable of the, the Good Samaritan, or compassionate Samaritan, as we called it last week. We thought about the conditions that should produce compassion, the great need in the world. We thought about the conduct actions that should flow from compassion. Compassion shouldn't just be there on its own, feel pity and lead us to do nothing. We thought of the command to show compassion, go and do likewise. We thought of the catalyst to show compassion, Jesus and what he has done for us, the mercy shown to us and how that should compel us to show compassion. That's the theory behind compassionate service the service we're all called to as Christians and deacons are to lead and oversee in the church. But what does it look like in practice? What does it involve in practice? See, it's possible to know the theory about something but not know how to put that theory into practice. It's possible to know the, the workings of an internal combustion engine to know how gears and, and brakes, how those systems work within a car, but yet not have a baldy clue how to drive that car. You can have the theory, but not know the practice. And it's ex exactly the same with our service. You can know the theory, 
but not know how to put it into practice. So this week, having looked at the theory about compassionate service last Sabbath night, this morning, we're going to think about what it involves in practice, how we, we put into practice, how we apply those principles that we drew out from, from this parable last week. And we saw last week that Jesus answer to this question posed by the lawyer, who is my neighbor? You know, I'm to show compassion, I'm to show love to my neighbor. Who is my neighbor then? Jesus' answer to that question was incredibly wide. His answer in the form of a parable was, your neighbor is anyone who needs you to be a neighbor. You're to show compassion to anyone who needs it. That's incredibly wide. But Jesus isn't saying that, that we're to show compassion to everyone who needs it. Because we can't. Our resources, whether it's our time, our finances, just or simply our, our reach is finite, limited. We cannot possibly show compassion to everyone who needs it. He is telling us here to show compassion to everyone who needs it within our available resources, within the resources that we have. Yes, we're to give our resources sacrificially. We're to give them costly. It's to count us, as we saw last Sabbath night. But we can only help people out of our available resources. He is saying what Paul said in Galatians 6, verse 10, as we have opportunity, as you have opportunity, let's do good to everyone. So with limited resources to meet the mountain of needs that, that we considered last week, how in the world do we know who to help? How do we put into practice this theory that we learned last week? Well, the Bible gives us guidance on how to put that theory into practice, how we're to use our available resources in compassionate service. I have a I have an archery target. I trust those of you at home watching on, online will see those of you in the the, the church as, as well as the, the very back will be able to see is a printout of an archery target. And the Bible gives us something like, like an archery target to show us how to aim, how to target our compassionate service. See, we have the archery target with its, its concentric circles, this yellow target in the middle. That's where you get your most points. You're to aim for first outside that the red, then the blue, then the black, then the white. The Bible gives us, as it were, an archery target, a central yellow target to aim for in our compassionate service. If you have that covered, it says, okay, well, you aim for the red target, wider, bigger, larger circle. If you have that covered, then, then aim for the blue one, and so on. Expanding spheres of compassionate service, rippling out like the ripples in a pond whenever you, you throw in a stone, if you like. And it's these expanding spheres of, of, of service, or the different colors on, on the archery target, that we're going to use to, to focus our thoughts on as we, we seek this morning to see what the Bible says about how we put into practice the theory of compassionate service. And the first sphere of compassionate service, the yellow area on the, the archery target, uh, as it were, for our compassionate service that we're given in the Bible is our family. Family. You have an obligation to your family. Before you start thinking about how, who you're going to serve out there, the Bible says you've got to start, you've got to think about your family. Yeah. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, Paul writes, if anyone doesn't provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an, an unbeliever. He says you have a duty to provide a duty of compassionate service to your family. I'm sure you've all heard the expression, charity begins at home. Well, Paul says here, compassion begins at home. Before you start to think about anyone else who might need your compassionate service, you have to ask yourself, is there anyone within my household, any within, within my immediate family, extended family, who needs my compassionate service? Meeting the needs of people outside your family without considering the needs of people inside your family, or at the expense of people within your family, Paul says is wrong. What does that involve in practice? Well, it involves compassionate service to elderly relatives who need help, to parents, grandparents, 
great uncles and aunts. It involves compassionate service to relatives who are suffering a debilitating illness or a relative who's caring for someone with a, a debilitating illness who you just, they need a bit of res respite. They need a little bit of support themselves every now and again. It involves making financial provision for people in your family who've fallen on hard times before calling on, on the wider church for help. It's a form of service that's draining. It's constant. It's unrelenting. It's unseen. <laughs> it's unrewarding in, in terms of, of earthly rewards. It takes you away from other things that you want to do. Maybe other forms of service that, that you'd like to be engaged in for God it may lead you to think, well, I'm not doing anything for God. You know, this is taking me away from, from my service for, for God, for his church. But friends, this is the service God calls you to. Firstly and foremostly, your family. If there's a need in your family, God says you're to meet it. And in doing it and meeting that, you're, you're serving him. You're doing it for him. And to give yourself to some other area of service and doing so and neglect needs within your family, no matter how worthy that service is outside your family. Paul says it's abdicating your God-given responsibility to care for your family. We've many, as I look, even as I look around the congregation, I see many wonderful examples of people within our congregation faithfully serving your family. Think of William and John, service over many years, faithfully, dedicatedly to their mom, Anne and Jesse, a sister and her family, a brother-in-law, wider family circle. I think of Jill and, and David serving their own mothers. I think of Johnny serving his mom, I think of Colin, what he's currently serving his own mom, Joy, Gary, Ian, and their parents. That's a service that God calls us to. First and foremostly, our family. It is your primary calling, the yellow target, as it were, on the archery target for compassionate service. Second sphere of, of service. You know, if if you've, you're hitting the first target, you have other resources, or maybe you're, you've no one within this target to, to hit, then the next, the, the, the red area, as it were, within the, within the archery target, the, the wider next area of service we're, we're to aim for is our church family. Our church family. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul writes, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone but especially, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Paul says, when it comes to doing good, we're to do, yes, we're to do, good, to do good to everyone, but we have a special obligation to do good to those within the household of faith, within the church. And within this sphere of service, again, we have, we have further expanding areas of service. Firstly, we have our own congregation. You have, you have your immediate family of faith here in, in this congregation. The family of faith, as you know, it isn't restricted just to this little congregation. It extends well beyond that. We have, we have our, the wider denomination. We, we have the family of faith here within the community in, in Ballyclare. Beyond that, we, we have the, the Church of God, the worldwide family of faith right across the world. Our compassionate service to our church family includes all these elements. Beginning with our immediate church family here, and rippling out, as it, remember the, the ripples from the stone in the pond, rippling out in, into all of these areas. And at the center, the very center of this expanding area or spheres of service is our church family here in Ballyclare. We are to do good to those within our church family here in our congregation. And in Acts chapter 4, one of those passages we read, we have an example of what that looks like, what that involves in the local church. Paul tells us in the church in Jerusalem, there wasn't a needy person. There wasn't a person in need. Why? Because they gave freely of what they had to those who needed it. 
They shared what they had with those in need. That's what the church should look like. Not one needy person because we share freely what God has given us with those who need it. And yes, uh, I mentioned in the course of, of the series in Deacons, yes, we have a government that provides unemployment benefits and sickness benefits and pension benefits, but the, the government's provision doesn't meet all the needs of all of the people all of the time. It's imperfect. And where the needs of the people within the church aren't being met, we are to meet it. We are to meet those needs. And it's not only financial needs. It wasn't only financial needs. It were, yes, that was a focus in Acts chapter 4 and wasn't only the financial needs. People in our congregation who are ill, who are hurting, who are burdened, who are lonely, who are anxious, those with caring responsibilities just need a bit of support or respite. We are to meet the needs, those needs, the people within our congregation have. And this compassionate ministry is not one that is best served by, you know, by, by a formal ministry. You know, the deacons may be putting together a sheet, leaving it in the porch or passing it around uh, once a month, twice a year. Say, no, if you, if you have a need, put it down and, and, and we look at, at meeting it. Or leaving it with you to come to them and, and ask, ask them for help. It is a ministry that is best accomplished informally by people knowing each other relating to each other in deep relational intimate love relating so closely to each other that you're able to see you're able to feel you know the needs in each other's lives without being asked without being told a ministry that is that is developed by people in a close-knit community with open eyes and open ears open hearts and open hands. And it involves all of us, other deacons, those of you are deacons, will be deacons, and members alike, breaking outside the comfort zone, the group of people that we usually interact with in church, all of us, all of us as, as the family, the church family, interacting with each other in a caring, compassionate love. So as to be in a position to exercise this caring ministry within the people of God. That's the compassionate ministry we're, we're called to in the church we see in Acts 4. But as I said, our, our compassionate ministry that to the family of faith, it extends beyond our congregation. And if we're meeting the needs of people within our congregation, then we're, we're to extend the sphere of, of our service to the Christian community outside our church people, whether it's across our denomination, the Christian community here, wider Christian community in Ballyclare. What does that look like? An unexpected illness that leaves a family struggling financially or needing support and care, whether it's in a church family here or a church family across our denomination. A sole caregiver in an obvious need of respite. A sudden death that takes the life of the sole breadwinner in a family. As we become aware of, of needs like that, whether it's in the Christian community here or across our, our wider denomination, we, as we have opportunity, as we are able, are to meet those needs. And beyond that, there's a worldwide family of God, the, the, you know, the worldwide church. We see fellow Christians across the world who are suffering deprivation or, or persecution. We should uh, be be seeking to, to alleviate those needs. Again, as we are able, where we have opportunity. In Acts chapter 11, we read about the Christians in Antioch sending uh, relief to Christians in Judea and Jerusalem who were suffering famine. Second Corinthians chapter 9, Paul exhorts the Christians in Corinth to send support to the Christians in, in Jerusalem in another period of famine. As we are able, as we have opportunity, having met the needs within our own family, within our immediate church family, our, our closer church, as we are able, as we have opportunity, we are to meet the needs of our fellow Christians wherever they are. We're to do it both as individuals in our individual capacity, 
We're to do it as a church under the leadership of our deacons. As we do in, in our end of year donations or in, in donations giving over the course of the year in response to, to specific appeals or, or specific needs. That's a compassion that we're called to as the people of God. The second sphere of service, this red area, as it were, on, on our archery target is our church family. Our family, our church family. The third sphere, or sorry, the next sphere of, of service, if you've covered the yellow, you've covered the red, then the blue, the black, and, and the white areas, blue, black, and, and white areas, they, they come under one heading or under, under one combined title, everyone else. Everyone else. Paul says in, in Galatians 6, verse 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Our compassion isn't to end with family. It's not to end with our church family. It's to extend to everyone. And within this uh, apology to make, maybe thought that was our third and final point. There's, there's three more points. Our compassion and service isn't to end with our family. It isn't to end with, with our church family. It, it's to extend beyond that. And there are three areas of service we're going to look under this, this title of everyone. And the third sphere of service, this blue area, as it were, in, in our target, is that of our neighbors, our neighbors. The first two areas that we thought of in which we exercise our, our compassionate ministry is our family and our church family. Those were related to biologically. Those were related to spiritually. And now we're going out into the world beyond those we're related to biologically and, and spiritually. And the first people that we come across when we step out of our front doors, when we step into the world, is our neighbors. When God's word tells us to love our neighbors, to show compassion to our neighbors, yeah, that command involves everyone who needs us to be our neighbors, but at its very basic, it includes those who are our physical neighbors, those who live next door. Sadly, we don't have the same community spirit and interaction between neighbors that previous generations enjoyed. Today, we largely keep ourselves to ourselves. Our homes are, are places of refuge. We like to come home from work, close the door, and, and stay there, lock ourselves away from the outside world until we're forced almost to go back outside the next day. But that spirit of individualism, that withdrawal in, into our shells, is something that we as Christians are called to resist. Because behind all those front doors in your street, in all those houses, there are people with needs that you're called to in compassionate service. There are hurting people with broken marriages, broken homes, with all manner of hurts and, and disappointments, there's loneliness, isolation, people forgotten by family, by the world. People in your street are struggling with, with difficult children. They're struggling with issues that their children are facing. There's people in your street caring with elderly relatives, people struggling with illness, with grief, with bereavement, with loss, with abuse, with guilt, all manner of, of questions problems and we are called you are called as a child of God God has placed you in the home that you live to meet the needs of your neighbors in compassionate service to be a compassionate neighbor he calls us to step outside our comfort zone he calls us to put off the lure of of our slippers or our lounge pants, if, if you're into those sorts of things, to put off the, the lure of that at the end of a busy day and step out of our comfort zone into the lives of those you live among. It involves sacrifice. It will involve rejection. It will involve being misunderstood. It takes a lot of thought and creativity to break down walls, to develop relationships that are necessary to truly serve the people you live beside, to serve your neighbors. Stop, you know, introducing yourself to, to a new neighbor in the street, stopping and speaking to them whenever you, you see them outside their front door. You know, 
intentionally buying too much of something or, or making, begging too much of something to give to them. I remember a day that I was working in the front garden and Ellen came home from Asda. I'm mortified. I was mortified. She stepped out of the car. She had, I don't know, two or three chickens that had been in, in the reduced section in Asda, 20p. She exclaimed about boldly walked over to the neighbors across the street who have, to my knowledge, have no need of a 20p chicken. And, and look, I got this in Asda. Is it a, it's reduced 20p. And, and I was mortified, absolutely mortified. I was wrong. It opened an opportunity and a relationship that we build on just by a simple, simple act of a 20p chicken that probably ended up in the bin. Creating opportunities to develop relationships so that you can be the compassionate heart and hands of the church to them, so you can be the hands of Christ to them. And you may well be the only Christian that your neighbors ever meet. What impression do they have of Christianity through what they see in you? Do they think it's a very insular thing? It's an inward looking thing and yeah, they keep themselves themselves and, and yeah, they, they look after Christians and other people within, within their, their little group. But really that's, that's their only interest. They have no concern about the community, people around them. They don't have a real heart for the lives of others. Or through your compassionate service, do they see people who care? really care, genuinely care for the people around them, the community they live in, people who have a real heart. Third sphere of our service, the blue area on our target is our neighbors. Moving out then, fourthly, the fourth area, or the fourth target for our compassionate service is our community. Community in Ballyclare, community in Newton Abbey, our community in Northern Ireland. Our community has a mountain, a mountain of needs and of people with needs that need our compassionate service. We listed, we listed many of them last week, drug problem in our community, the effect of, of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, addiction on so many youth, disengagement, antisocial behavior, criminality, an overcrowded uh, care system that just can't take the number of children that, that, are, that are being forced upon that care system single mothers you know, struggling to, to raise children on their own and need a support, broken marriages, broken homes, abuse, people who are lonely, people who are, you know, the, the loneliness and, and isolation, vulnerability felt by so many of our elderly people in our community. We have areas of, of high deprivation that the current the cost of living crisis is, is only making worse. The Department for Communities oversees a neighborhood renewal strategy to target communities in Northern Ireland who are suffering the very highest levels of deprivation. The very highest levels of deprivation. We have one of those areas in Ballyclare. I didn't know that until this week. An area of extremely high unemployment in 2003, whenever the scheme commenced, almost 60% of people living there had no qualifications. Here in Ballyclare. And when Paul says in Galatians 6, verse 10, do good to everyone, these are the people, these are the everyone that he's talking about. When Jesus told the story of a compassionate Samaritan, he described how the Samaritan came across a bloodied, beaten, half-dead man at the side of the road, and how he stopped, he looked at him, he, he bound his wounds, he took care of him at a great risk and cost to himself. And the end of the story, he said, go and do likewise. The, those, these hurting, lonely, isolated, hungry, overlooked, despised people in our town, these are the very people that Christ meant when he said, go and do likewise. And yet very often when faced with the needs in, in our community, aren't, aren't we more like the, the priest and the Levite? 
good religious people who just walk on by. Safe in our ivory towers, with our needs well catered for, caught up in the pursuit of our own well-being, feathering, don't we often feather an already well-feathered nest? And we walk on by. And don't think that I'm preaching down to you today. I've applied that paragraph, those two paragraphs to myself over the past three days. They catch me. As they catch many of us. And again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, that it's wrong to spend our hard-earned money on ourselves. But it is if it isn't accom accompanied by, by sacrificial, costly, compassionate service. It's difficult. It, it calls for sacrifice. It will hurt. It involves putting yourself out. It involves putting yourself at great risk. It involves forgoing things that otherwise you could and, and would enjoy and would like to enjoy. That's what it means to sacrifice. That's the sacrifice that we're called to. To show in sacrificial service to a very needy community. Giving sacrificially of, of ourselves. Our, our finances, yeah, our time to some aspect of, of service to our community as you are able, as you have opportunity, whether it's Youth for Christ, we're giving some time to them and their service to the community, CAP, the food bank, whatever else, supporting those ministries with, with your time, with your efforts, with your finances, that's what we are called to as we are able. Yeah, I've already said we can't meet all the needs in our community. Our resources as, as individuals, our resources as a church are, are limited. And we have other needs, yes, to meet within our family and, and, our, and our church family. But where we are able and where we have opportunity, both as individuals and a church, we are called to sacrificial, compassionate service, giving of ourselves, our time, our finances, our resources to be the hands of Christ in the community. And to the extent we're not doing that, we are failing in our calling as Christians. As a session, we, we don't make heavy demands of you as members. Two services after two prayer meetings, morning and evening on the Lord's Day. Thursday evening prayer meeting. Monthly men and women's fellowship. No children's activities in between to cater for our children's needs. We don't have such a restricted program so that, so that you, know, you, you can spend the, the rest of the week in, in splendid isolation. You know, it, but so that having fulfilled your family commitments and, and, and alongside your recreation, you can give yourself to, to acts of, of spiritual and compassionate service so that you can serve your family, your church family, and your wider community as we're called to in this way. And to the extent that, that we, I include myself again, to the extent that we are not doing that, we are failing in our calling as Christians. Family, church family, our neighbors and our community. The fifth sphere of, of service, the white target area on, on the target for our compassionate service is the world. The world, I've already mentioned how the, the Christians in Antioch sent money to the Christians in, in Judea in time of famine. And Paul exhorted the, the Christians in, in, in Coram, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, to, to provide for the needy Christians in, in Jerusalem at another time of famine. And in addition to all those examples of, of Christians helping other Christians across the world, we have plenty of examples of, of Christians being sent out to help non-Christians. When Jonah was sent to Nineveh, an enemy state, Christ's command to his disciples in, in Matthew to take the gospel to all nations and to all the world, Philip's ministry to the Ethiopian eunuch, so Paul's ministry himself in, in the center of the Roman Empire, Rome, 
with numerous examples, we are to have a heart for people right across the world. Not only in spiritual ministry, but compassionate ministry. Not only to Christians, but non-Christians. People suffering famine and drought and poverty and malnutrition, poor health care. When, again, whenever Paul says in, in Galatians 6 verse 10, to do good to everyone, these are the everyone. This is the everyone that he was referring to. Yeah, again, the need is enormous. Enormous. Too great for us as, as individuals and a little church family here in, in Ballyclare to, to meet in full. But as again, as individuals and, and as a congregation, as we are able, as we have opportunity, out of our plenty, we are called to give ourselves to compassionate service to meet these needs. That's our target. You want to print out of, of this to mark up after the service? Just, just say, I'll email it to you. That's our target for our compassionate service. Family, church family, neighbors, community, the world. Putting into practice the theory of last week. Now, as, as we close, I, I just want to make one further point. Our compassionate service is not to be at the expense of sharing the gospel. It's not to be done instead of sharing the gospel. It would be easy to do that. It's a ministry that is lauded by the world, that is accepted by the world, that is expected by the world to do good to the, to the needy. You know, they, they accept that. You know, the gospel, no thanks, but we'll, we'll, we'll take your help with the needy. And we're not to fall into that trap. It isn't to become the sole focus of the church to the exclusion of spiritual ministry. It is to be hand in hand with the gospel, side by side with the gospel in the sport of, of work, of proclaiming the gospel, and on occasion secondary, often secondary to the work of the gospel. Because friends, there's no point in meeting someone's physical needs if you fail to meet their spiritual needs. And yeah, you make this world a little bit easier, but you condemn them to an eternity lost in the condemnation of hell. It, no, it, it's a wrong priority. It is to be done in support of gospel work, to help advance gospel ministry, to soften hearts for gospel ministry, to be, to be a picture of what the, the gospel is, the compassion of Jesus for lost sinners, for sinful humanity. It's hard, it's draining, it's costly. It involves sacrifice, it involves foregoing things that we would want for ourselves, other things we'd like to do. But in Galatians 6 verse 9, verse before the one that has sort of been our focus this morning, Paul gives us a great motivation and encouragement for compassionate servants to keep aiming for this target, not to give up aiming at this target. He says in Galatians 6 verse 9, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season you will reap if we do not give up. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. He says, don't grow weary. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel, because if you keep going, you'll reap a harvest. Maybe, maybe a harvest of souls, people coming to faith, but most definitely the harvest of Jesus' reward when you stand before him. His words of reward, his words of commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter into the joy of your master. He says, keep going in that motivation. In Jesus, well done. In his commendation for faithful service as a child of God here in this world. Amen.